Hello, hello. We got people coming in already. Let's see. This much. Admit all. Hello, everyone. Come on in. I uh, logged in early in case anybody has any questions. So, by all means, fire away if you have any questions. We'll go ahead and get started. More coming in. We're already up to 10. Actually, nine of you plus me. Uh, you should notice, hopefully I've gotten it done. I do believe I did. I've uh, readjusted the due dates on the homework assignments, giving you a little bit more time because we're running a little bit behind. Uh, I also haven't posted the practice tests for test one, so that's partly why I'm doing that. But I just want to make sure you guys have ample opportunity to ask me questions about 21 and 22 and to, you know, investigate other examples. Like I've told you some hints about what you could do to make uh, that one integral we did in chapter 21 a little more robust or to change it around a little bit is uh, instead of it being, uh, let's say, infinitely long, it could be finitely long and you can integrate it, say, from negative L to positive 4L or something like that. Then, of course, the, the actual Y component of the electric field is not going to cancel out. Uh, so that's a neat little thing you can do. You could also say that the uh, the charge is not uniformly charged. It could be U is equal to some constant times, say, the absolute value of X. If that's the case, then the farther you get away from the origin, the larger the charge gets per unit meter. And by using absolute value, it's not going to change signs. So you can do stuff like that. And then, of course, do the interval all over again. Uh, stuff like that of course there's also the one where you did uh, i didn't show that example it's pretty straightforward but uh you can find it in my youtube examples but you uh, also can find it in your textbook where they did a i think they did a circular disc and then they let the circular disc become infinitely large and stuff of that sort so those are all things you can do to make sure you know how to do them i highly 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 recommend you go over as a bare minimum the examples in the book and you read the examples, see if you can make sense of it, take some notes in the margins if you want, just try to make some sense of it. Uh, then write down the problem or at least take a photograph of the problem without the actual solution, close the solution and see if you can actually do it from scratch. If you run aground, you get confused or something, open it back up, look at the solution again, Start it over from scratch would be better, or you could start off where you are and finish that one and then do it again, but keep doing it until you can get basically uh, each of the examples in the book again as a bare minimum uh, solved. So actually, I'm sorry, I just mentioned the integral and I was thinking we were in 242, so that, that integral probably <laughs> ignore that. That was chapter 21. We're covering chapters like one, two, and three. So I, I'm sorry, I forgot which. I just got out of my 242 class, so I'm just used to thinking that. Uh, so, so far, just that's still a, a valid explanation that I definitely try to make sure you can do the, all the examples in the book, make sure you can do the examples that I've gotten on my YouTube channel. I've got some where uh, a speeder passes by a police car going in the opposite direction, the police car has to slow down, turn around, that sort of stuff. Those are some pretty good tricky problems. I did a few extra problems over the weekend. If you're... Uh, the module for credit lot. Yes, someone mentioned that to me. I will change that right during class. Uh, so, or right after class, uh, I will make sure that's corrected and I will send out an email once it's done. So, uh, I sorry to ask you for this because you, Mariana, and various other people have mentioned this to me. Uh, so, if I forget again, okay, uh, if you don't get an email from me tonight that I got it done, then by all means, send me an email and say, hey, Mr. Younger, you forgot to extend the deadline for the uh, for the extra credit because that's just me being a goober. Hopefully I'll remember, but, you know, I don't know if y'all know this, but I'm like super, super old. Like I'm in my 50s. So that's really old. I'm like 52. So anyways, here we are. Uh, we still got, well, we technically don't have any more time. Does anybody have any questions before we get started? 
Okay. Well, I, I would like you to read over that section in chapter one, of course, about the uh, fair May calculations or specifically quick estimations. And I'd like to say, you know, let's do something like uh, estimate the number, or excuse me, how much money is in a stack of pennies that is, say, 10 miles tall. That, that's a neat example. Another example is uh, how many Fruit Loops can you fit on a basketball court? Uh, I would do, for instance, in the case of a penny, a penny is a little bit thicker than a millimeter in thickness. Remember, a millimeter is about the, the thickness of a staple, not, you know, the staple shape like this. I'm not talking this thickness. I'm talking this thickness. That's about a millimeter. You can see a penny is maybe one and a half, almost two millimeters thick. Uh, so you could actually just basically take 10 miles uh, put it in the appropriate units and divide it by 1.5 uh, millimeters, and that'll get you the number of pennies that you have in a 10-mile stack of pennies. And then you can, of course, divide that by 100, and that'd be the number of dollars you have. So that's a, that's a very typical uh, calculation, estimation calculation you do. And you can do that ostensibly straight in your head, okay? Uh, we know, for instance, that a mile is about 1.6 kilometers. We know that a kilometer is about... Uh, a thousand is exactly a thousand meters. So that's about sixteen hundred kilometers divided by one point five millimeter or sixteen hundred meters divided by one point five millimeters. Uh, and obviously, a meter divided by a millimeter is basically a thousand larger than a uh, meter divided by a meter. So you might as well take the one point six divided by one point five. Just call that roughly one. Call that one thousand on the top, and then you're doing. 1,000 over 1,000 or 1,000 times 1,600, you're looking at 1.6 million. Uh, if you move it over one place, that'll be 160,000. If you move it over another place, that'll be 16,000. So evidently uh, a 10 mile high stack of pennies is about, uh, well, basically about 10,000 slash $16,000, somewhere around in there. So that's not a bad estimate. Uh, Fruit Loops on a basketball court, uh, you can figure a basketball court's uh, about, uh, I'd say, 50 feet wide by like, mm, I don't know, 95 feet long or something like that. So maybe we call that uh, a certain number of meters, obviously. I'd call it maybe uh, 30 meters long by 15 meters wide. And then just divide that area uh, by what you think the area of a Fruit Loop is. A Fruit Loop looks to me to be about... Uh, one and a half to two centimeters in diameter. So you can calculate the area of that circle and just assume we're going to lay them out as an area of circles, but they're going to take up a square area equal to the diameter times the diameter. Divide that by, assume the ceiling of the, of the actual gym is not 10 feet, obviously. It's not like a typical house. You're going to have to be at least 20 feet, but I'd go ahead and say, assume that it's 10 meters, which would be 30 feet, and that should probably be good enough. So 15 by 30 by 30 meters is a good size basketball court with the open air above it. And now you, instead of just doing the number of, of uh, Fruit Loops that fit on the floor, you could do the total number of Fruit Loops that would fit in the uh, rectangular area, uh, excuse me, the rectangular volume that would make up the area of a volleyball court, I mean, a tennis, excuse me, tennis, a basketball court. So in that case, you're gonna say, uh, a fruit loop is about, let's say, two millimeter or two centimeters wide, two centimeters long, and I'd say it's about a half a centimeter thick. Calculate that volume, divide it by, divide the 30 by 30 by 15 meters by that number, and that should give you the number of fruit loops it would take to fill, say, a basketball court that literally just has the lines right at the edges of the court, so it has the walls right at the edges of the court. So those are some typical estimates you can do. Remember what Lawrence, uh, hang on, since that beep happened, I can't remember his last name. Uh, Lawrence, I uh, can't remember his last name, Weinstein, that's it. At ODU, he's written a book called Guestimation. Then he wrote another book, the, the second edition called Guestimation 2.0. And that tells you, hey, if you're in a pickle and you need to make an estimate, what you can do is sort of think of what's the absolute smallest that I think is reasonable for this thing? And then what's the absolute biggest that I think is reasonable for that thing? And just take the geometric mean of the two. And the geometric mean just means multiply the two numbers 
and then take the square root. If you're taking the geometric mean of three numbers, you'd say, uh, multiply the three numbers, take the cube root. If you're doing it of 12 numbers, you multiply the 12 numbers, divide it by the, and then uh, take the 12th root, so on and so forth. But obviously, where you're normally going to use a small n and a big n. Good Lord, there's a lot of people in my class are still coming in. <laughs> we're, up this, we're up to 19. Wow. <laughs> All right, so that was the last little tidbit. I remember last time we showed you unit dimension and dimensional analysis uh, and uh, unit analysis. And we were able to, without really any knowledge of physics, just me telling you the units of energy and, uh, you, and telling you the units of speed, like in the speed of light, we were able to actually uh, calculate the exact correct formula just by using dimensional analysis for E equals MC squared. So that was kind of neat. But now we've got to move on to chapter two, uh, which is about kinematics. And I sort of hinted at that already. So uh, let's get started. So first off, what we're going to talk about is some of the variables that are associated uh, with kinematics and what kinematics is. So if you were to study Newtonian mechanics, that basically is the study of matter. Uh, specifically, it includes the area of mechanics and the area of kinematics. And kinematics is basically the study of motion without respect to what caused the motion. So, for instance, you might say, hey, I'm looking out here and this ball rolling down my road uh, is currently traveling at 1.5 meters per second, but if I watch it long enough, I can see that it's actually speeding up in that same northward direction at a rate of 0.5 meters per second every second. Okay, I also say that at t equals zero, when I looked at it, it was moving at 1.5 meters per second. It was at the origin of my coordinates, so I'd say its initial position is x zero equals zero. Now, from that with kinematics, I can tell you any point in time later, assuming no, nothing changes, like there's no additional forces, uh, the, the road's going to stay flat and smooth, go straight forever that way, no wind's going to blow, friction's not going to be taken into account or doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. And from that, I can tell you at any time later in the, in the future exactly where that ball will be and how fast it will be going. Now, obviously, that's uh, a nice thing to think about, but obviously friction forces and stuff like that cause problems. But still, in principle, it could be done. And in, in fact, if you did it on the surface of the moon, it'd be even easier, uh, at least as far as throwing stuff as opposed to rolling stuff, because obviously they're still going to have friction. But at least when you're throwing stuff, they're going to have very little air resistance because there's essentially no appreciable atmosphere around the moon. Mars would be comparable. It does sometimes have some some atmosphere, but not usually. Okay, so that's kinematics. So kinematics is how does velocity, time, position, acceleration, how do those all intermingle to get things like final position, final velocity, or position at some time later, or velocity at some time later? And then mechanics is, okay, how did I make that acceleration happen? Okay, and that's another part of Newton's laws. And, and he said, if I have seen further than others, it's only because I stood on the shoulders of giants which, as I told you before, is a very humble comment, but it's really not so humble. It was also a smack in the face of Robert Hook, who was probably like four foot seven or four foot eight or something. And he's saying, if I have seen further than others, it's because I stood on the shoulders of giants, not hobbits like you, Mr. Hook, uh, who, again, by, you know, uh, at all points in his life, Hook was essentially Newton's enemy. <laughs> Uh, Newton had a lot of them. Leibniz was another one. We do think we have some pretty uh, remarkable evidence now suggesting that Leibniz did at least in some sense steal the idea of uh, Newton's system of fluxions that we now know of calculus. Uh, so we do think that probably Newton did still invent the calculus well before Leibniz. And it also looks more consistent because Le Leibniz comes on the scene with much more beautiful symbology and if you know anything about creation, when you're creating things, you don't necessarily know where they're going to pan out. Like, for instance, when we were trying to classify stars, uh, there was these ladies that, uh, you know, misogynistically was uh, referred to as Pickering's harem. And they were basically a bunch of, quote unquote, housewives 
And literally, he was such a jerk. He was complaining to his male graduate student who wasn't away at World War I saying, you're an idiot. Uh, my housekeeper could do a better job, which is supposed to be an insult to the housekeeper, of course, and more of an insult to the guy. But well, it turned out the housekeeper was a woman by the name of Amy Jump, Annie Jump Cannon, and she turned out to be bad. I mean, really freaking awesome. She ended up cataloging something like 250,000 stars. She got to the point where she could just look at a photograph and immediately tell you the star was an A0, an A4, or a B7, or whatever. And when they started doing those stars, they just called a certain number, of a certain characteristics of the star they associate, associated with A, a different characteristic uh, the same characteristics that they're talking about with A, but a different variety of it would be B and then C and then D and then E and then F. And they were basically going through the whole alphabet. When it was all said and done, uh, we eventually figured out, another female, by the way, figured it out, that uh, all those letters were extraneous except for O, B, A, F, G, K, M. So if, you know, leaving us to come by and stolen for instance, that information from, uh, quote unquote, Pickering's harem, he might have just started off with, oh, these are A-type stars, these are B-type stars, these are C-type stars, because he knew exactly where it was going from. So that's sort of what happened with, with Newton's uh, physics, uh, or with Newton's calculus, I should say. So uh, back to the reality of kinematics, we need to understand things like position, distance, displacement, speed, velocity, scalar, vector, all that sort of stuff. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to make sure everybody's on the same page. So I'll start off with suggesting that we don't need a new formula. I want you as many times as absolutely possible. I want you to not think, oh my gosh, here's this new things that, phys that our physics teacher taught us. And it's just a nightmare. I don't know what it, what to do it. I want you to instead try to think, what did Mr. Younger just tell us about and how does that relate to my everyday life? Do I have something in which I make use of that? So for instance, we're gonna learn about speed. And it turns out that most of you either ride in a motor car or a bus or something like that, or even own a motor car or a bus. Sorry, I'm slipping into uh, Monty Burns from The Simpsons with my motor car. Uh, but, but anyways, uh, in that mode, uh, you know that your, your van, your bus, your car, your truck, or whatever has a speed ometer. An ometer means a meter for measuring stuff. And can anybody tell me or type to me what exactly are the units on your speedometer? Miles per hour. Miles per hour, yes. And mile is a unit of time, distance, smelliness, what? Distance. Distance, very good. And hours is a unit of? Time. Uh, and does anybody, this one's a little tricky now. So some people think one thing and some people think another. Does anybody know what mathematical operation corresponds to per, P-E-R? Division. Division. So guess what? You already got the formula. You've got it right there on your speedometer. It says miles per hour. So clearly speed is distance divided by time. Also, we have this wonderful happenstance that the word speed starts with S and the type of quantity that speed is, is in fact called a scalar quantity, S-C-A-L-A-R, and that too starts with an S, okay? A pure number is a scalar, anything that has just pretty much one thing that you have to report with it, well, maybe even two, you could, for instance, call one dollar or one meter or one mile per hour, uh, because they have units, they are what we call denominate numbers. Think in terms of what denomination bill is that? In other words, is that a $5 bill, a $10 bill, a $100 bill, or whatever? So numbers with units are called denominate numbers, and they can be scalars as well. So you can have a scalar that has not only a magnitude, but also has a unit, but that's it. It can't have a direction associated with it. And then there's another quantity, uh, which is like speed, but it's called velocity. And velocity just so happens to luckily start with the letter V. And the type of quantity it is, it is also starts with the letter V and that's called a, anybody know the bad guy from Despicable Me? Vector. Vector. And I'm sure I've gone over this with you guys. I'm just wanting to make sure we rehatch on that. 
So yeah, Vector was the bad guy. So it's a mathematical term. So it, it means I uh, I chose it because I do evil with direction and magnitude, right? So and that's actually a, a decent definition of a vector. A vector is a quantity that has a magnitude and a direction. And in fact, an archetypal uh, uh, vector would be, for instance, a uh, arrow or a pin or something like that, because you could associate, for instance, with a what geometers call a directed line segment, you can associate with it a length that you can sort of represent as the magnitude on some scale. For instance, you might invent a scale that one centimeter is equal to one Newton, which is the unit of force, and that would be fine. And it also has a direction associated with it where this is the direction it's pointing and this is the direction it came from. So it could be just a line with an arrow right here saying it's going that way. Uh, now, as long as you're not dealing with what we call electric fields or, or fields in general, vector fields in general, you are allowed to move this vector anywhere in space. You're just not allowed to stretch it because that would change it, to compress it because that would change it, or to change its direction. As long as you don't do that, then you can move those vectors around all day and all night. Again, when you get to the point where you're actually dealing with what we call fields and vector fields, it'll be quite obvious that you you know that you can't move them around in that sense. But right now that works just fine. So the good news is in chapter two, we're just doing these one dimensional motion where the vectorness of it is indicated, uh, its direction is indicated by whether it's a positive or negative. And the magnitude, by the way, of these vectors, the magnitude of all these vectors are always just going to be positive, period. If it's got a negative in front of it, that just means it points in, the, in whatever your coordinate system called the negative direction. OK, so that's our two quantities, uh, the scalar speed and the scalar direction. And in fact, it's a little more special than that in that the way I told you to calculate the scalar speed is something called the average speed okay so i'm going to share my screen with you guys uh, that's where i am okay and there's my youtube channel just in case anybody needs to know so we're going to have this quantity s average which we could write as s a v e r a g e which you might also choose to write as S-A-V-G. That's clearly a lot shorter. You could also write it as S with a bar over it or less than S than greater than symbol. All those things mean the same thing and they mean average. And in fact, the definition is distance traveled. divided by the time taken. Okay, so if you're driving on a trip, as you might have seen in my YouTube videos, hopefully some of y'all have subscribed to my YouTube channel because I did see a couple of my videos, got over 16 views uh, of the ones I made this weekend. That's good. Uh, if you subscribe, it'll give you a, a notification, assuming you don't turn the notification off, whenever I post a video. So that's kind of helpful. But the average uh, velocity, forget all the other averages you heard about, like averaging your test to get your test score. That's not it. The average of speed is the total distance traveled divided by the total time taken. And we can even shorten that by just saying, uh, let's say, uh, delta x over delta t. I was seeing d in my other class, and that became a problem because I'm going to talk about instantaneous, and it ended up giving me a weird derivative. So I'm just going to say how much your how much you traveled, and it's not just really like this is a little misleading to say delta x because delta x means final x minus initial x. But if you went from the origin to negative one, to positive three, to negative one, to positive four, to negative one, to positive 12, to negative one, to positive four, then four minus zero would normally be what delta X means. So I don't want you thinking of that. I want you thinking of this is the total distance traveled. 
okay? So keep that in mind. That's the damage of, of using a symbol like delta x because delta generally means final minus initial. Uh, you might actually call it maybe even x over delta t. That might even be better, okay? So again, in this case, it's also the total distance you move. So in other words, try to think of it as your, as your odometer on your car. When you start a trip, you'll, you'll write down the odometer readings to the nearest tenth of a mile. When you finish your trip, you'll write down the odometer reading to the nearest tenth of a mile. You'll do the subtraction, oh, final minus initial. And no matter what you did, even if you backed up and went forward, backed up and went forward, backed up and went forward in your driveway a thousand times, it's still going to accurately, if you've seen Ferris Bueller's Day Off anyways, it's still going to accurately tell you uh, how many how many miles you drove, okay? So that's what the average uh, speed is. Now, we could also think in terms of a instantaneous speed. And if we were to do that, what we try to do to try to, to nail it down to an instantaneous speed, uh, I could look out here in the street and see a, a child ride by on a bike. And maybe the child rode by the edge of my driveway uh, and maybe I'm pretending like that's my origin, only they're driving northward, which means they're going in my left direction. So they're going in what I would normally call the negative X direction. And maybe I even have little markers out there that I've painted on the road because I'm not much of a geek. So I know exactly how far they traveled. And I could take and film that bike riding by and start the timer the instant they got to that edge of the driveway, which is like my or, like my origin for my coordinates. Again, we're doing just one dimensional motion. They're going right against the edge of the road. So my marks on the edge of the road are about the same distance away. So that's an accurate or faithful rendition of the distances. So if I made a mark every meter, then I could easily figure out how far they traveled. And maybe I watched the, the child ride by for uh, let's say an entire 12 meter distance. And I find out that they do the first eight meters in like one second, but then they do the last four in like eight seconds. So then you'd say, okay, well, the average speed there is actually equal to 12 meters divided by eight seconds. And I would reach the conclusion that obviously four goes into 12 and eight, and it goes three halves times. So that's 1.5 meters per second. But I would say that hardly is a real good representation of the kid's motion. Uh, for instance, I, I bet you might find a split second at which that child was going 1.5 meters per second, but that that's all, okay? So what I might try to do is figure out how fast they were going, say, at each second between t equals zero second and t equals eight seconds. So I noticed there's almost no change in going from the eight meter mark to the 12 meter mark. And remember, that was the one that actually took uh, what I say that took the, the whole. Uh, I said the whole thing was eight seconds and it took, let's say it took. Uh, six seconds to go the first eight meters and two seconds to go uh, the last four meters or something like that. Well, I might look in that early range and instead of looking over, say, one whole second, I think that's what I did. I said one second, they went eight meters and then uh, seven seconds, they went the remaining 12 or something like that. So maybe I take that first second and I say, okay, well, how far did they go? I measure the distance, I divide it by time. That would give me the average speed over that one second. That average speed didn't look anything like when I took the eight meters and divided it by however many seconds it took me to do that, I uh, took the boy to do that. So those ratios weren't that similar, which means the speed was still changing significantly. But if I said, okay, well, let's try instead of one second, let's try half a second. And let's say in the in the one second interval, I got delta, or actually, I'll use the new symbol. I got I got d bar is equal to at, oh I didn't want that and I did it again. Is equal to x over delta t, and I got uh, let's say three point five nine seven two. 
And then I tried 0 0.1, uh, 0 point, uh, 0, no, I don't want that. That was 1.0 seconds. I'm going to say I wanted 0 0.5 seconds, and if I could ever erase that one. Now, this time I said D bar was equal to X over delta T. Again, the, the delta T decreased, so, so did the X. So this time I got 3.5971. Well, if I actually want four sig figs or four decimal, decimal places, then this just isn't good enough. So I'll try instead 0 0.01 seconds. And in this case, I get D bar, which is X over delta T. I get 3.5971. One again, so that's starting to make me feel a little better. If, if I go yet again to 0 0.001 seconds, and I get d bar is equal to x over delta t is equal to 3.5971, then I know for a fact I've let my time shrink close enough that the child is not making an appreciable change in speed in that interval. And I've basically done what Newton told us to do, but in a case that we didn't necessarily know how to do, right? Newton told us to take a limit as delta T approaches zero, but he told us how to do that in some sense when we had functions S of T, like we have one half AT squared plus 13 T or something like that. Did someone ask a question? I heard a, a voice. Okay, let me put the chat window up too. That'll help. So if I wanted to actually look for the instantaneous speed, this is telling us that S instantaneous is actually when you take the limit as delta T approaches zero and you calculate what we called X over delta T. And that, in fact, is dx over dt, okay? And I just want to be uh, mindful, or want you guys to be mindful, that that is a formula that I made up with a symbol x, and it's going to look like the same thing for the velocity, but it means something very different with the speed. Uh, the average speed, of course, is another thing we can use, and it's all this stuff. OK, so I can ask you a question like this. Uh, actually, I don't want to use that color. If, if you traveled five hundred point zero miles, in, uh, let's say, let's say 12.5 hours, what is your average speed? Okay. So this solution should be fairly straightforward. We know that the average speed, the average speed S bracket is just equal to the distance divided by the time or what I chose to call X over delta T, that would be fine as well. And I know my distance is 500.0 miles divided by 12.5 hours. Now, notice I gave it to you in hours and decimal hours. That is not the norm. As you'll see in my YouTube videos that I posted on a similar problem, I gave you times like 13 hours and 23 minutes. Okay, that's a very much more typical physics problem, especially for calculus-based physics. So what you'd have to do is then say, okay, well, 13 hours, 23 minutes, I know the whole number part's 13 hours, but the 
uh, if I want it in miles per hour or kilometers per hour or even meters per hour, I need to make sure that time's in hours. So I'm going to take that 23 minutes and say that's 23 over 60 hours. I do the division 23 divided by 60, and I just tap that decimal, tag that decimal place uh, or decimal number to the end of the decimal after the number 13. In this case, we looked out. I know that 2 times 12.5 is 50. Uh, and then I know that 100 times or 10 times 50 is 500. So I know that uh, this is actually 20. And I'm going to double check my arithmetic because after all, I am doing this in my head. 40. Thank you, 40. <laughs> yeah. Uh, see why I, why I did that? I say 500 divided by 12.5. And that gives you 40. Thank you for doing that, by the way. I really appreciate it when you guys are uh, calculating along with me. Uh, I have fat fingers, and I sometimes have to use the calculator on my phone, and it doesn't always take the numbers when I push them. So, yes, this is an average speed of 40 miles per hour. Very simple, very straightforward trick. It can get worse, though. For instance, what if I were to tell you, here's another example. On a 500.0 mile trip, you travel half of the time, or let's say half of the distance. With a S average of 50.0 MPH. Notice I'm just gonna write MPH because that's common enough we should know it. And the other half at average speed equal uh, let's do 70 miles per hour. What is your average speed? Okay. So that seems straightforward enough, right? Uh, the big deal is uh, typically students want to just say, add those two and divide it by two. So if I added 50 plus 70, I'd get 120. I divide that by two, I get 60. And that'd be great, but that's not the definition of average speed. Average speed is the distance traveled divided by the time taken. So first off, what I got to figure out is how long does it take for me to go half the trip, which by the way, since the trip was 500 miles, half the trip would be 250. Uh, I need to figure out how long it takes to go 250 miles at 50 miles per hour. And then I need to know, figure out how far, uh, how long it takes to go 250 miles at 70 miles per hour. And I do that by realizing that S average is equal to the distance traveled over delta T, but I need the time. So it's actually nice to algebraically solve for time first because it turns out when you algebraically sign or symbolically solve an equation for symbols, then you now have the solution to an infinity of problems, where if you just pl plug in the numbers, you have an answer to exactly one problem. So the delta T is going to turn out to be just the distance traveled divided by the average speed, which for the first part is going to be 250 uh, 0 0.0 miles using my proper number of sig figs, and that's going to be divided by 50.0 miles per hour. Notice that miles per hour is miles over hour, and when you divide a fraction uh, or a number by a fraction, that's the same thing as multiplying by the reciprocal. So far as the units go, I'm going to be multiplying by hours over miles for the denominator, and I'm then I'm going to that's going to be multiplied by the miles, so the miles actually cancel out. Uh, 250, by the way, goes into 50 uh, exactly five times, so this is be 5.00. I have four sig figs up top, but only three on the bottom, so I will carry one extra sig fig and say that this answer is five hours. 
So that's part of the time we know. In order for us to calculate the average speed, I have to know the total distance, which I already know is 500 miles, but I also need to know the average time, which I have to compute this way. I just figured out that part of it's 50 uh, or five hours. Now I've got to figure out what the other part is. So for the second leg, the 70 mile per hour leg, maybe I'll subscript this T, the 50 mile per hour leg. The 70 mile per hour leg is going to be 250.0 miles divided by 70.0 MPH. Again, miles per hour in the bottom becomes hours over miles with hours in the top and miles in the bottom. So the miles cancel out. I can see that the zeros cancel out between the 250 and the seven and I see in the 70. So I see that 25 divided by seven. I know that seven goes into 21 three times. And then in fact, I'd have four sevenths left over. Uh, four sevenths is 0.2, or excuse me, uh, one seventh is about 0.1428. So four sevenths would be about 0.4. Uh, and then plus eight. So that'd be 0.48, somewhere around there. But either way, I'll go ahead and do the math just to keep from making a careless mistake. 250 divided by 70. Yes, sir. I got 3.571. Is that I said four? I meant three, but yeah, 3.571 sounds good. Now this has three sig figs, so I'm going to write 3.571. That's actually four sig figs, and I'm going to underline the one so I can keep track of that. And that's ours. Okay. So now finally, I can say the total average speed is the total distance traveled, which is 500.0 miles, divided by the total hours, which would be 8.571. Uh, carrying again one extra sig fig, and that's in hours this time. So I do 500 divided by 8.571. That gives me 58.34. And that four is an extra sig fig. And I'm gonna say that's MPH. So you see that the average doesn't really work out like the typical average, even though I went half the distance at 50 miles per hour and half the distance at 70 miles per hour. I came pretty close to getting 60, but I did not get 60. And I, it doesn't even round to 60. It rounds to 58.3. So that's an interesting thing uh, that we can learn about averages. Uh, we could also say, what if I drove at 50 miles per hour uh, for the exact same amount of time that I drove at 70 miles per hour, what then would be my absolute speed? Well, uh, you got to work that out a little bit, but you could in principle do that as well. Another problem you could do, for instance, let's call this an example. Let's say you travel 200.0 miles of a 300.0 mile trip in, or let's say, at 55.0 miles per hour okay at what average speed should you travel for the last 100.0 miles to average 72.0 miles per hour for the 
whole trip. So that's a little more complicated question. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to say, okay, we traveled two, uh, at 55 miles per hour for two hours. Obviously, to calculate the average speed, we need the total distance divided by the total time. But in this case, we actually have the total speed. So we're going to have to solve for something else, as you can tell. So first off, let's go ahead and figure out how much of our time we've used in driving the first 200. So again, the average speed at 50 is equal to x over delta t. And that gives us that delta t is equal to x over s average at 50. I did, oh, 55, sorry. I changed my numbers there right in the middle. So in this case, it's going to be 200.0 miles divided by 55.0 MPH, which obviously gives us uh, hours. So uh, 200 divided by 55 gives me 3.636. That's four sig figs, which is more than we're allowed to have. So I'm just going to underline that six just to keep it. And that's going to be hours. So I've already used up 3.634 hours. If I really wanted to average 72 miles per hour, then uh, that would be, in fact, the X over delta T. That would require the delta T to be uh, basically given by 300.0 miles divided by 72.0 MPH. And if this turns out to be bigger than, or excuse me, smaller than 3.636 miles, it's just impossible. We can't even, you know, do the speed of light to do it. Well, in some sense you could if you take into account relativity, but we'll ignore that. So we'll do 300 divided by 72 and that gives us 4.166. That's four sig figs again, which is more than we deserve. Uh, so I'll actually change that last digit from a six to a seven and put an underscore on it to indicate that that is not a sig fig. And in fact, that's the number of hours. So the total hours I have left, so the hours I can use on the last 100 miles is delta T is equal to 4.167 minus 3.636. So if I divide, I subtract this from 3.636, I get zero, this is gonna be bad, 0 0.530. And technically we're subtracting here, so we only got two sig figs uh, in the decimal place. We don't have a whole number. So in fact, 5306, both of these digits are insignificant and that makes it hours. So we really are supposed to call this 0 0.53 one bar hours. So our final average speed, so average speed for the last 100, has to be distance divided by time, which has to be 100.0 miles divided by 0 0.531 hours. So 100 divided by, that gives me 188. <laughs> uh, we only have two sig figs now, so technically I'm not even supposed to use that. 
uh, and that has to be MPH. So in fact, we'd have to call this approximately 190 or technically 1.9 times 10 to the two MPH. So see how the average speed doesn't necessarily act the way you expect it to. Any questions on that? All right, so that's average speed. Now, I've already given you an idea of how to find instantaneous speed. And in fact, uh, these question, these equations that I blocked off, you will not find them in your book you are allowed them on your equation sheet and you are required to make your own equation sheet for your online test and for your face-to-face -face test. You might not even want them for your online test, but uh, it is limited in time. So you might take a little bit too much time to go looking stuff up. So by all means have one. Uh, but the main thing is these two that I wrote on this page that are boxed, the S equals S average, blah, blah, blah. And the S equals S instantaneous equals blah, blah, blah. Those are completely fair, even though you won't find them in your book. Now I'm going to uh, derive some other ones that will mostly be found in your book. So you can do all sorts of cool, cool stuff with these average speeds. Please, again, look at my YouTube video. I did some stuff where like I, I drove to, and these are some, some of it's basically real data from where I drove to uh, Daytona Beach and one time uh, putting my family through a great deal of angst by only stopping three times on my entire trip from uh, North Carolina to Daytona Beach. Uh, but anyways, I, I made really good time and that was very, very big happy day for a nerd dude like me. So anyways, let's, let's look at the other terms. Now, we already hinted at the velocity being something new and the velocity being something new is that it's a vector quantity, but that doesn't matter too much because we're still in two dimensions. Uh, by either the end of the day or by next class, we'll be doing three dimensions. But what I'm going to tell you is that the velocity, which again is a vector quantity, is just going to be on average delta x over delta t. And this delta x is something very specific. It is your uh, displacement. vector. So delta x, you can sort of think of it as either uh, x final vector, in which case I have to put an x uh, vector symbol over all those, your x final vector minus your x initial vector, where these are your position vectors. And by position vectors, I say you get up in the morning, you create, at least in your mind, a coordinate system. Maybe your coordinate system starts at the side of your bed. Maybe your coordinate system start, starts at the center of the, of the stairway uh, off your porch going to the outside. Doesn't matter. Wherever you set that coordinate origin to be, at any point in time, you can imagine a vector pointing from there through buildings, through trees, through everything, touching exactly your center of mass. That's your position vector, okay? Now, if you really wanna say your, your position vector from the instant you were at the origin, then you're always gonna do the vector that you currently have minus the zero vector, cause that's what the uh, origin is. It's a vector uh, whose X, Y, and Z are all zero. But more, more uh, likely you wanna say, okay, well, what is my average velocity? And first I walk from my steps to Starbucks and then I walk from Starbucks to say TCC. Well, in that case, your initial position vector would point from your origin to Starbucks. And then your final position vector would point from the origin, the same origin you had to Starbucks. And then you would do the Starbucks vector minus the or uh, excuse me, the uh, TCC vector minus the Starbucks vector, and that would get you what's called your displacement. And the reason that makes a big difference is, 
imagine a small child who doesn't quite understand the rules of a baseball game. Uh, he hits a ball, he steps on home plate, and then mama starts to record him. And maybe he runs, say, 50 feet to first base, he hangs a left, runs 50 feet again to second base, hangs a left, runs 50 feet again. And I'm just making these numbers up, by the way. Uh, I don't remember what they are in, in various kid leagues. But he takes another left at second, runs another 50 feet to third base. He realizes a kid's out in the outfield picking his nose, not even looking at the ball. So he makes a run for it and takes another left, runs from third base to home, touching home plate. And you stop the timer the instant he got to home plate. The average speed, let's say this, the kid took 10 seconds, the average speed for that would be 50 plus 50 plus 50 plus 50. That's 200 feet divided by 10 seconds. That's 20 feet per second. That's the average speed. Now, the average velocity is zero because his initial vector and his final vector both went from some origin, and what you call the origin is irrelevant, but it went from that origin to home plate, and then it went again from that origin to home plate. So the average velocity actually turned out to be zero, even though he really did run. Okay, so that's that's the key uh, fundamental difference between average velocity versus average speed, uh, and that also is a reason we cannot say that the speed is the magnitude of the velocity. A lot of times it is. A lot of time the, the speed is the magnitude of the average velocity and magnitudes are supposed to be positive quantities. So even if you've got a velocity that's negative 50 meters per second, that just means the, the, the magnitude is 50 meters per second, but it's going in your coordinate system's negative direction. Any questions on that? So I'll remember, I'll put down here T-ball Average speed is 50 feet plus 50 feet plus 50 feet plus 50 feet divided by 10 seconds, which gives you 20 feet per second, whereas average velocity, actually, let me not write that version of average velocity, would be zero vector minus zero vector over 10 seconds equals zero vector, okay? And that's specifically because started and ended in same place. So, it's not safe to say that the magnitude of the velocity is the speed. Usually it is, but there are cases where it isn't. So if it's a strict true or false question, you say false. Any questions on that? So this is your average velocity. And if you took a little note from the previous, you realize that the instantaneous velocity We get a better color. V instantaneous, which you could also write as V of T, meaning V at any instant in time T, is actually equal to the limit as delta T approaches zero of delta X vector over delta T. Again, in one dimension, all we're saying as a, as a vector goes is if the X minus the initial x gives you a negative number, then the velocity points in the negative direction, okay? And that's more than enough. Uh, this, by the way, also turns out to be v of t is equal to dx over dt. So now I've got two more equations you can add even though these two are identical. Uh, and then you've got that third equation for the displacement vector giving you the average velocity, okay? Now, what Galileo said was that a uniform speed or a uniform velocity is essentially any motion 
for which at a given time interval, the object will traverse the exact same distance. OK, so what you've got to do to make that work is you can you've got to decide on a time interval. I'm going to let my time interval be a tenth of a second, say. And then you look at any part of its motion and you watch it for a tenth of a second. And if it covers the exact same distance in that particular instance, and then later on in some particular instance, you look at another tenth of a second and it covers the exact same distance, then that thing is mo moving with a uniform velocity and therefore has a uniform velocity or a constant velocity. Okay. So that's how we got to this concept of velocity. I mean, it's a pretty big deal. Galileo went in just in the hiding after the Inquisition. Uh, basically, he was forbidden to study uh, the laws of astronomy, uh, specifically because he had more, more or less wrote a book in which he uh, gave a dialogue between uh, an educated person who's sort of an intermediate an educated person that holds the position that Kepler slash Copernicus did, uh, excuse me, uh, Galileo and Copernicus held. And then another guy who was supposed to be intelligent uh, was holding the position of the church and they gave him the name Simplicio. So that was kind of a smack in the face. And he even interpreted scripture when a noble woman asked him, well, what of Joshua 13, 10, when God made the sun stand still, uh, he said, oh, well, that's where you have to read the Bible as metaphorical, because if in fact God had done that, he explained the logic behind it, but if God had actually stopped the sun, it would actually have the opposite effect. It would actually make time go a little bit faster. So kind of a, a bad thing, uh, especially around the time where you've got Martin Luther you know, nailing things to a wall about your church doing stuff wrong. Uh, Galileo had, had recently heard of Giordano Bruno being burned at the stake later. I think even uh, Joan of Arc would be burned at the stake for similar type things. So uh, once confronted with the instruments by which his entrails would be removed from his gonads, he decided to recant. And luckily, the then Pope happened to be a former Cardinal who was a close personal friend of his because I'm convinced that that's the only reason why he got in house arrest as opposed to all the other things. So he realized that one of the things he discovered was the what he called the Medician moons, which we now call the Galilean moons of Jupiter, Io, uh, Io Europa, Ganymede, and Callisto. Those are objects that actually are not left behind by the sun, by the uh, Jupiter, even though everybody in all the models knows Jupiter's moving. So he figured he had to understand motion. He wanted to understand free fall, but it was too fast. So he studied gradual inclined planes. When an object goes up an inclined plane in the first time interval, it might go this far. And the second time interval, meaning like a tenth of a second each time, it might go this far. And the third time interval, it might go this far. So he knew it was not uniform speed. But what he discovered was that it was a uniform, what we now call acceleration. And what I mean by that is in a given interval of time, again, you got to choose the interval of time, say a tenth of a second or say one second. Uh, in one second, for instance, the velocity consistently dropped by one meter per second. In two seconds, the first half and the second half, each of them dropped by exactly one meter per second. Uh, so that's the hallmark of uniform acceleration, i.e. what we call constant acceleration. And that's what he discovered objects in free fall were doing. And later we were to make out once Einstein came up with the second law of of motion, he said that the total force F acting on a body is equal to mass times acceleration. Well, if you compare me to, say, one of the uh, more petite people in my class, I happen to be what I'd like to say is 200 pounds, but I'm going to truthfully say is probably 260 pounds. Uh, and if you drop me from the Leaning Tower of Pisa, I weigh 260 pounds, and what's pulling me is gravity and gravity turns out to be a force directly proportional to my weight or my mass, the mass of the earth, which obviously isn't going to change, and the distance between the center of the earth and me, which isn't going to change. Now, if you put up another person that's perhaps somewhat petite and weighs 130 pounds, 
then that person has half as much force of gravity acting on them. So you might think since F equals MA, they're gonna accelerate twice as fast. But guess what? The mass on the other side is the mass of the thing accelerating. So when my force of gravity went up by a factor of two and going from 130 pounds, which is the petite person's weight, to 260 pounds, which is the non-petite, but clearly very handsome physics weight, <laughs> okay? That went up by a factor of two, but luckily so did the M on the other side, and that's a reluctance to accelerate. So exactly the increase in weight was exactly the, the increase in inertia, and therefore we both fall at 9.8 meters per second every second. So that's what Galileo was able to discover about gravity. And now I've given you enough, believe it or not, to do a lot of the stuff from chapter 22, or excuse me, chapter two. Now I'm gonna go through the actual kinematic equations. We have about 20 minutes left. That should be easy peasy. So, well, I got a question. yes, sir, go for it. So basically you're saying uh, you both should be falling at the same, at the same rate. That's exactly right. And that supposedly was the experiment that Galileo did. We think it's apocryphal now, but his idea would have been, you know, dropping a, a, a ball of lead, say this big, and a ball of lead this big at the same instant, and they should both hit the ground at the exact same time. They didn't so have very good measuring devices, but they had a buttload of paperwork, so we probably would have found that. But in reality, we went to the moon and did that experiment and, and it was exactly right. So we tried something similar before. We dropped a stone and uh, something lighter. Uh -huh. And actually the stone sort of dropped faster before the other uh, equipment. Yes, and that's exactly right. But what you're not doing is you're not imagining, and this is one of the big things that, that Galileo brought to science, is Galileo saw that when you roll a ball down an incline, in the first interval, it only goes this far, in the second interval, it goes this far, in the third interval, it goes this far. So he saw that it was speeding up when it went down the incline and slowing down when it went up the incline. So he imagined that if you could actually make it perfectly horizontal, it should neither speed up nor slow down. So he suspected the natural tendency of an object is to maintain its motion period. And what he then did was he put up sort of like you can think of it as a half pipe, but basically he put an inclined plane where you roll a ball down and then it hits an inclined plane going back up. And what he realized is when he, when the inclined plane, let me stop sharing this for a second. Uh, when the inclined plane went down like this, ran into a level and then went back up like that, the ball on this side got almost to the same height at which he dropped it on this side. So he went back and polished it up real smooth, waxed it up real good, sanded the ball. And in fact, the ball that rolled down came even closer. He did it some more and it came even closer and he did it some more and it came even closer. So he argued that, oh, wow, I bet you if I could get this, uh, this little bit of force that's causing this thing to slow down, if I could get that to zero, it would probably go to the exact same height and then he imagined, what if that second incline was so gradual that it went, you know, let's say four light years, which you didn't have the idea of light years back then, but imagine it went four light years before it ever got as high as it was before. Then he reasoned that the, uh, the object, the ball, would roll at that constant speed forever. So what he was doing was imagining a scenario that couldn't be made real in their technological time. So you can do a Google search and write this down, or actually I'll type it for you guys. You can do a search for Galileo experiment on the moon. And you will see an Apollo, I want to say Apollo 15 mission, maybe Apollo 15 mission where they take and drop a hammer and a feather at the exact same instant. And boom, they land at the exact same instant because, again, the moon doesn't have an atmosphere, so air resistance is not an issue. But you're 100% right. If you look at a heavy object and a piece of paper, the heavy object's going to fall uh, faster, way faster than the light object, especially like a feather. It's going to do that kind of stuff. 
But if you get rid of air resistance, it does exactly what Galileo predicted. So excellent question. Uh, question. So yeah, Google that when you get a chance, Galileo experiment on the moon. Anybody have any other questions? Okay, so now I've given you the reason why the acceleration is constant. And you will know, and I've even given you the figure for that matter, uh, when an object falls vertically, it's going to fall at a uniform acceleration, not a uniform velocity, a uniform acceleration such that in every second, it's going to go from whatever speed it has to that speed plus 980, 9.80 meters per second, or plus 32 feet per second, roughly, if you wanted to do it in feet. Uh, and that also means when you throw a ball up, in other words, the term that makes it behave that way doesn't care whether the object was already moving up or moving down. It's just going to change that velocity by 9.8 meters per second, no matter what. So if you call down the negative direction and up the positive direction and you release a ball at 19.6 meters per second going upward, then its velocity is going to change by subtracting 9.8 each second. So at the end of one second, it's going to have gone from 19.6 meters per second to 9.8 meters per second. And then at the end of the second second, it's going to be going zero. And then at the end of the thir third second, it's going to be going negative 9.8. In other words, headed back towards the ground. And the end of the fourth second, it's going to be going negative 19.6 meters per second. So when you say acceleration, I want you to say it like, like I'm explaining it here. Yes, it's okay to write 9.8 meters per second squared, but I want you to call that 9.8 meters per second every second or 9.8 meters per second each second are 32 feet per second per second, uh, just so you'll get a feel for what acceleration is, because it turns out students really have a hard time often differentiating between velocity and, uh, and acceleration. So velocity is the instantaneous rate of change of position, whereas acceleration is the instantaneous rate of change of velocity. So acceleration is to velocity exactly the same way as velocity is to position okay so with that in mind you can probably guess that the acceleration a average is going to be delta v over delta t and of course i'll put a bar over it now i'm going to turn on because i'm not quite senile <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and share my screen before anybody catches me not sharing my screen. I, I was almost about to say that. <laughs> That's okay. Do, do, do say it. I'd rather uh, look like a senile old man and, and have you say it than y'all miss stuff. So the average velocity is the change in velocity divided by time. It is technically a vector quantity. Again, we don't have to worry about that right now. But in vector form, you would write a vector maybe call the average by putting it in brackets and you'd say delta v over delta t and you might think wait a second i learned about vectors in pre-calc and i know i can't divide vectors well that's okay because delta t is a scalar and there's this rule from arithmetic that you might recall a divided by b is defined to be a times the reciprocal of b so really what you're doing is just if the change in time was uh, four seconds, you're just multiplying by 0.25 because that's the reciprocal. OK, so don't fret it on that one. Now, you might also guess that the instantaneous acceleration. Anybody want to guess what that's going to be? How about if I give you a start with a letter L? Would it be the limit of delta V over delta T? Exactly. So limit the approaches limit. zero. As delta T approaches zero, exactly, of delta V over delta T. We'd still go through that same process, if you will. I put a vector symbol on there, so I should put a vector symbol on here. We'll still go through that same process in a practical application by taking smaller and smaller intervals until the number of decimal places we want are consistent. Uh, and that's the way your computer's going to do it, unless your computer's working symbolically. 
Uh, but if you don't have a function for velocity as a function of time, this is the way you got to do it is by shrinking the time intervals over and over and over again. So we now have that. Now let's look at what happens. What if we make the special arrangement? So I'm going to change this to black and create a line and say, consider A equals a constant. Okay, in that case, we can say A, and I'm taking one dimension, so I'm getting rid of the vectorness of it, just ignoring that for right now. A is equal to dV dt. Well, other than multiplying through by zero or dividing through by zero, whatever you, you can do anything to an equation you want, as long as whatever you do to one side, you do to the other. So I'm going to multiply both sides by delta t, or by dt, so I get a dt is equal to dv dt times dt. Now, you might think, what the poop is Mr. Younger doing? He just took a symbol apart, because we know the symbol for the derivative is dx over dt or dv over dt. But it turns out, if you were to, say, take this class at Princeton or MIT, uh, if they even offer calculus at the MIT level, uh, sometimes they don't even start so low, quote unquote, so low. But if they did, the third semester would almost certainly include something called calculus on manifolds, and they would do things like one forms and vectors. And that's what these little Ds are. These DVs and DTs can be thought of as one forms, which is sort of like the opposite side of a coin, one side of which is vector, the other side of which is a one form. So it is okay. This is kosher. And like always, you're going to learn a lot more math uh, from your science teacher than you are from your math teacher. Your math teacher can teach you a lot more math, but it's just going to wait a lot longer and you're going to get it from your engineering or physics or chemistry teacher first. So what I just did was I multiplied the constant A by DT and I multiplied the DV DT by DT. And now I'm going to integrate it. This is called solving a differential equation. Now I could integrate this without, without range of integration and I would get a integration constant for each of them. And of course I could combine them two and just get one integration constant and that would be fine as well. But what we found out is it's better if we just go without the constants of integration and define what we call initial conditions or boundary conditions. So I'm gonna integrate this constant dt from t equals zero to t. And mathematicians generally hate the integral going to the symbol next to the D, but we're going to do that anyways. And of course, I'm actually, the DTs are sort of canceling out here, and I'm getting the integral of a derivative, which according to the fundamental theorem of calculus, the integral of a derivative is equal to the argument of the derivative. So I'm actually going to integrate from V equals v0, which is what I call the initial velocity, the velocity at which time equals zero, to v of t. So when I integrate this, since a is a constant, I just get a t uh, equals V of T minus V zero. So that gives me an actual expression for V as a function of T. V as a function of T is actually equal to V zero plus A T. And that is in fact, one of our kinematic equation. And it happens to be one in your book that's numbered. Like if you looked in chapter two, it might be called 2.12 A in little parentheses. All the equations in your book that are in parentheses, that have that number in parentheses next to it, are allowed to be on your equation sheet. So I've got that question. Now, I also know that V of T, which I might also just call V, is equal to DX over DT, right? So with that in mind, I can say V0 plus AT, multiply both sides by DT, is equal to DX over DT times DT. Integrate 
integrate, again, we're solving a differential equation, which is, you know, you probably even have, haven't even had differential equations yet. But this time, the V0 and the A are constants, but not the T. And since I'm integrating over T, I'm going to integrate from T equals zero to some finite time T later. And in this case, the DTs appear to be canceling out. So I'm integrating from X equals X zero to X of T. Again, this is X at T equals zero. So when you integrate this left-hand side, you, you guys should try to predict what I'm going to write down here first because you know the V0 and the A are constants. So you should easily be able to integrate this. If you, if you make a mistake, it's not a big deal, but try to think of it so you can be a more active learner. So what I end up getting is, and I'm going to rewrite it in a different order, I get one-half AT squared plus V0T is equal to in this case, x of t minus x zero. So finally, I'm going to write x of t is equal to one half a t squared plus v zero t plus x zero. This too is one of our famous kinematic equations. And again, the necessary condition for this to be true is that the acceleration is a constant. This one could also be true if A equals A average. In other words, if you use the average acceleration, that would work as well. Okay. So these require A equals a constant. Now, what if I would like to know the position, but I only know data like, uh, or what if I want to like know the velocity, but I only know like the initial velocity and the position data, but I don't know anything about time? Well, that's okay. I can take this equation, which I'm going to call one, and this equation, which I'm going to call two, and I'm going to solve one for t. And that gives me T is equal to, notice how I'm going to drop the V of T and just call it V like V final. So that'll be V minus V zero over A and plug into two. When I do that, I get X. Notice I'm dropping the X of T again. I'm going to pull the X zero over here. I'm going to say minus X zero is equal to one half A times, now the T is going to be V minus V zero over A, and that's got to be squared. So that's this term. And now I've got to do this term. So that's going to be plus V zero times V minus V zero over A like that. I can, uh, for starters, eliminate one of the a's in the first term and get a common denominator because notice the a squared in the bottom is going to cancel out with one a on top and just leave me, leave me an a on the bottom with a two. So I'm going to say v squared minus 2v v0 plus v0 squared. That's me just squaring the numerator in that first term. All that is going to be over 2a. Now, that 2a I went ahead and made uh, as a denominator on the second term, too. Uh, so I've got to multiply through by 2a on that. And I have a plus here, and I have a v0 times v. That's going to become 2v v0. And I got a negative v0 squared. That's going to become negative 2v0 squared. And you can see now that the uh, negative 2v0 squared and the v0 squared here gives me just negative v0 squared. Also, the negative 2vv0 cancels out with the positive 2vv0. So I get x minus x0 is equal to v squared minus v zero squared over 2a are 
V squared is equal to V zero squared plus two times A times X minus X zero. And that is our other kinematic equation. Okay. So that one also is the one that's numbered. Some instructors will not let you use this equation because it's not a vector equation. In other words, when you solve this, say, for final velocity, you've got to choose whether you're taking the positive or the negative square root, and you've got to use your physics intuition to figure that out. So it's not strictly a vector equation, but I allow you to use it. So we now have uh, derived all our uh, kinematic equations. You should uh, look over some examples in your book of how to use them. I think they're very straightforward. You just got to remember things like the definition of acceleration, average acceleration is V final minus V initial. So if your coordinates pointing to the, to the right and your initial velocity is higher than your final velocity and you're going to the right, then your initial velocity subtracted from your final velocity is actually going to give you a negative, and that means you're actually slowing down in that case. But you can flip your coordinate system around, and in that case, a positive uh, acceleration would mean you're slowing down. So you've got to think about all those. I try to think of them as vector quantities. The velocity points in the positive x direction. That makes it a positive vector quantity pointing to the right. And when I do that, that keeps me straight as to whether I'm putting A as equal to negative 9.8 and V0 is equal to positive 9.8. The main thing is you got to realize sometimes terms are fighting each other, like one half AT squared could be fighting the V0. If I threw the ball up at 19.6, the V0 is going in the upper direction, which most people call positive, but the acceleration wants it to speed up on the way down. So the acceleration is pointing in the negative direction. So no matter what coordinate system you knew, you use the one half ATC, T, one half AT squared term has to be in conflict with the V zero T term, meaning they have to have opposite signs. So you can either think of it like that, or you can think of it as A, having a vector quantity pointing in a very specific direction uh, with your coordinate system created where maybe up is positive and right is positive, or you might choose down as positive because, for instance, you were, you were trying to analyze a person that threw a ball down. And the fact that the two terms are added to each other tells you that they act independently. Your velocity in the vertical direction is always going to change by 9.8 meters per second each second, no matter what your initial velocity was. Okay, so those are all the big concepts and those are all the big equations. Uh, next time, I will actually derive a case where the acceleration is not a constant. You can find examples like that in your book. You can find examples like that in the practice test. And we'll, after that, we'll jump into vectors and then projectile motion. So uh, you guys are free to go. Feel free to stick around, ask me any last minute questions you might have. And do subscribe to my YouTube channel, even if you just do it for the semester. That way you can get notifications when I put new videos up. I suspect I'll be putting several up tomorrow. So have a good day and thanks for coming. So I do have one question. Mm -hmm. Is this a manual? Uh, yes, sir. Go for it. Uh, the final e equation, when you, when you say square is equal to V square initial plus 2A and in back at X minus X zero, zero that, that can be said to be 2A in back of X because X is actually X initial minus, or minus X final, right? Yeah, well, yeah, the what we have in the parentheses is X final minus X initial. So if even if you didn't think about a coordinate system and you just thought, hey, the person moved uh, five meters, you could just stick five meters in there and that would be fine. Copy that. Thank you very much, sir. No problem. Um, I have a question just um, we about test one. Okay. Um, I was a little confused. Um, I thought you said it was due today, but I haven't been able to find it or- It's not, yeah, it's not been created. Uh, we're a little bit behind. Uh, and I mentioned that a little bit of being a class, we're a little bit behind. So I hope to offer a practice test, say 
uh, probably tomorrow, and then maybe make the test available, say Monday, and be due, due by Sunday. And that's normally the way I work those those online tests is I give you at least one whole weekend to work on it. And I normally give you up to three attempts and only your highest counts. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Hey, no problem, Haley. Hey, Professor. Yes. Is this John? Uh, hey, hey, yeah, hey. this is John. So is the test one, it's um it's online. So when is our first proctor? Uh, if, if you look on our syllabus, that actually is a date I'm sticking to no matter what. So uh, let me kill this for a second and we'll look on our actual syllabus. So I'll go to, yeah, I'll go to that screen. So let me do a share screen with that one. Uh, yeah, that'll work. So I'm going to share that screen. Now I'm going to go to my modules. And then remember, there's this link over here that says syllabus. I haven't figured out how to work that really nicely, so I just leave it alone. I put my syllabus over here in like helpful uh, documents and links. So uh, the one with the latest date, which none of these have dates on it, so that's okay. Uh, if you have a problem with looking at syllabi with a bunch of different colors, use that one. But I'm just going to click on this one real quick. This comes out in HTML. Uh, what you'll see down here is a schedule and the midterm, this actually will happen on that day. On 229, we will have the midterm and it will happen during class, i.e., at 520 p.m. Okay, is that in the same room as the. Class. What's that? Go ahead. So is it um is it in the same classroom as the day class? Okay, so the deal is you're either going to have to have a webcam and a browser and a computer that can get on the internet, use Canvas and take Canvas practice tests, use Respondus Lockdown Browser and use Respondus Monitor. If your computer does all that, you can take it at home. But the key is you got to take it during that hour or so. Uh, and I normally like you to have a, a, like a whole two hours. So if you can start, you know, 20 minutes early or uh, stay 20 minutes late, that will be perfect. I've even sometimes just gotten the lab instructor to administer it during her lab time. But normally we just do it with that uh, Respondus Lockdown Browser and Respondus Monitor. Does that help? So it's just on the lockdown. Yes, sir. Sorry. Yeah, lockdown with the monitor. And instructions like you'll have to take the camera and show me your working area, all your blank sheets of paper, you'll have to hold them up front and back, you'll have to hold up a photo ID next to your face, make sure it's clear enough that I can tell your face is that face. You can cover up like if you don't want people knowing your driver's license number, you can cover that part up, but I need to see your name and face, of course. Uh, so that we verify that I look at all that stuff and then it gives me flags as to when quote unquote people were looking fishy. So I would ad advise you not to be looking under your table a lot and doing your work. Try to be a little more like I'm going to do my work this way. Okay. okay gotcha. Okay, sweet. Um, so it's just online, just to reiterate what you said and make sure I understood it. Cause my internet's a little spotty right now. Mm -hmm. Um, so it's on lockdown browser. Just download all the stuff I need for that, I guess. I'm pretty sure my computer is capable. It's the MacBook, so. Yeah, it um, should, should work. You might not be able to use Safari. You probably need to use uh, Google Chrome or Firefox. I have not okay. had much success with Safari. Maybe you do. If you do have success with it, go for it. But uh, I've always had to use Google Chrome or Fi Firefox. And lately, I've even had to use Firefox for uh, YouTube, which I'm sure Google's going to be excited to hear about. Cool. <laughs> okay, sweet. Um, yeah, I think that's everything that I needed. I appreciate appreciate it. No problem. You have a good one. And if need be, since you're normal, you're normally in my day class, we could also fit you in at the day class if you need to take the exam that way. That's not a problem either. I usually have them do it during during a uh, lecture, but using the lab computers and their own computers if they have them. Okay. Cool. Sounds good. All right. See you, John. All right. See you, Professor Younger. Professor? Yes, sir. There's no 29 days of February. <laughs> that that <laughs> would be a problem then, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs>
Yeah, that's what happens when you cut and paste. So I guess that'd be three <laughs> one, maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, we found an error, so I gotta fix that. But thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> um also, when is like how long can we access the math lab and mastering? Uh the the homework I allow you seven days. You can still access it, you just can't do it anymore. Uh, you can always go back and look at it, what you got wrong, what you got right, work it over again. Uh, mm -hmm. But you get seven days past the due date to make it up. Uh, if you happen to be one of the students that might have an accommodation, uh, if the accommodation allows you extra time, I have to abide by that. Uh, also, sometimes, like just recently, I went through and gave everybody an extension on chapters one, two, and I believe three. So the due dates aren't what they originally were set to be. So make sure you check on my lab and mastery and see what the due dates are now. Yeah, uh, I checked them earlier. Okay. Um, I think, I think that's all for now. Okay. Uh, do check out, like I said, I posted, I think, four or five new videos, and I've got maybe 11 sitting here on my desk that I've written out. I got to go over, make sure I did right, and then uh, make videos. I've got three that I've made videos for, but I got to do the processing of them. I don't edit them, as you can tell, but I do process them to make sure they come out in, in HD and stuff, so that takes a little bit of time. Uh, Mr. Younger? Yes, sir. Go for it, George. Um, so last Wednesday when you um about the homework, you said don't do any of the, the faux ones, or correct? Right. So on Wednesday, um I didn't do the faux introduction uh, to mastering, but mm -hmm. the day after it did drop my grade down. So I have that means zero. It's like it's not supposed to. Yeah, that will be taken care of. What I do is I go through like now we've reached the due date. Uh, so everything's supposed to be in. I wait till a week later because I allow everybody that extra week. And then I'll go through and I'll say, all right, which if, if students did two of them, which one was the higher grade? And I'm going to move that grade from the faux one to the correct one and just put it in there. And then okay, so I feel like I'd throw away the old one, but I haven't found out a way to do that. Okay, yeah, I did the new one, the one with the higher grade that was due last night. I checked and see and looked at the faux one. It did have the less score, so I just I just wanted to make sure. Yeah, the, it's supposed to be more points on the non faux one, and I don't yeah. know how that came to be, but it, it stuck there, and, and and I just I guess I'm gonna hate, hate myself till it goes away. Okay. <laughs> so you will fix it like a week later. Yeah, um, sometimes I just leave it till the end of the semester because it doesn't matter too much. But yeah, I will I will try to do it like within a week from now. Okay, just wanted to make sure. Thank you. No problem. Have a good one. The extra credit module. Thank you for reminding me again. I'm going to do that as soon as I get offline from here, Mariana. So thank you. About Taylor and the gentleman whose face I see, but no name do I see. Uh, James, yeah, I taught him already. How about Alexandria? Do you have a or Alexandra? Do you have a question? Maybe you are wondering how I keep my hair products so nice. What hair products I use? I don't know. Yeah, that would be interesting. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's <laughs> called bald o head. <laughs> <laughs> they did give me some tea tree oil and that's kind of creepy feeling but other than that i got nothing <laughs> um last thing yes so i found out um the approximate date and we're not when i'm leaving okay it would be like april 23rd to may 6th which is finals week yeah um, that does make it kind of tight uh yeah, again yeah. It's not going to be a big deal. We want to try to get as much of that work done as possible. If you have someone or some education person, guru in charge at the military or whatever that can administer tests, I have a sheet that they can fill out for me and they can take, you can take stuff there. If not, we'll just do an incomplete and we can correct it as soon as you get back. It will not be a big deal. I'll work with you. Okay. Yes, sir. Okay. Just remind uh, me again when we get closer because yep. I'm the absent minded professor. <laughs> yeah, I feel like um so like the incomplete would the uh, would be a better option. Just yeah, it might be because that that, it, that long of a date that could be kind of hard. The downside of the incomplete is 
I have to figure out a way to open the uh, Blackboard, or excuse me, the Canvas back up and the quizzes and stuff so you can properly prepare like any other student in the class. Uh, but we'll, we'll work through it. I've had students that do it. It'll be fine. Yes, sir. Okay. Thank you. All Good right. night. All right. Good night. See you, James. Taylor, do you have anything? All right. I shall call it a day. I don't think I made too terribly many mistakes on my problem solving today. I did manage to drive the kinematic equations for uh, acceleration be a constant. I did not derive the one equation that the algebra base course uses to derive that v squared equals v zero squared plus 2ax minus x zero. That equation is just that if the acceleration is constant, then v1 plus v2 divided by two is also the average velocity. Uh, I also didn't derive the expression for uh, x as a function of time, if you have a constant velocity, that is x is equal to x0 plus v bar t for the average, or x is equal to x0 plus vt uh, if the v is a constant. That's always true, and that's sort of what I'm hinting at on the problem in my YouTube where I talk about constant velocity over a trip from North Carolina to Daytona Beach. But I hope that helps. Hope you all enjoyed uh, the antics of the bright-shirted Mr. Younger. Y'all have a good day. Bye-bye.